So good evening, everybody. It's one of our more rare evening lectures. We had quite a few food for thoughts around noon because we had guests from all over the globe. In this case, our guest tonight is from Winnipeg. So Bruce Duggan. Bruce, Hi. about change. Frustrating slow in coming. That's what you <laughs> said. Yes. This sounds like impatience, but it's about acting and making now. That's how I know Bruce. Whenever he starts something, he wants to see results and outcomes. It begins with a sensitive analysis, followed by concrete deeds and precise actions. Bruce is a professor in management at the Buller School of Business at Providence University College in Otterburn, Manitoba, a nice place actually 50 kilometers south of Winnipeg. He is an alumni from the Asper School of Business. He is a musician and he is a living proof that economy and ecology, business and philanthropy are not contradiction in terms, but could mutually strengthen each other in an excellent way. Bruce was our visiting scholar of our department for two years, and there was always the plan to have him, have him for one or more presentations. Since he started to work with First Nation communities far north in Manitoba, he didn't have time for talks. He jumped into the work and I'm happy that he found time to share some of his of this work with us tonight. Bruce, please share your screen. I think I'm sharing my, am I sharing my screen? Yes, it's already uh, there, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, um, I'm, I was surprised that they let me be a visiting scholar. Um, and I'm delighted to be doing this presentation. So um, if people could, there's, there's time to talk afterwards. So if people could hold in the back of their head a question, something like, so why, or does something like this belong in a faculty of architecture? Uh, I feel like it does. Um, and for some odd reason, I really like being part or connected even loosely to the um, landscape architecture, but, um, I would bet that somebody will go, well, no, this is actually isn't about architecture. It's about something else. But anyway, um, I want to uh, talk to you about and, and introduce you to a community up in northern Manitoba. Um, but I also want to do more than that. I want to make the case that the, the probably the biggest issue we face <clears throat> as a society this century is how to get off our addiction of fossil fuels. And most people that I know think we need to. And many people that I know are really frustrated by how slow it is, how slow it's happening. Um, so I decided, um, why don't I talk about nations and energy transformation? Because I think there are actually two groups of people in Canada and certainly in Manitoba, who are actually leading uh, renewable energy transformations, um, Hutterites and First Nations. Um, someday maybe we'll do uh, invite in some Hutterites and talk about what they're doing. Um, but both communities, First Nations and Hutterites, tend to be fairly invisible to the broader community. And so my hope is maybe let's make them more visible. Um, yeah, I'm a, a business prof and I teach at a wonderful little university college um, out in Otterburn and I teach in the Buller School. I love being there. Um, one of the wonderful benefits of being there is they let me have the time to do the stuff I'm doing up north and they see why it's good for um, Providence and the Buller School and for my students. Um, the specific community I'm going to introduce Introduce you to is a place called Northlands Denis Suskini First Nation. It's on a lake called Lac Brochet in northwest Manitoba. 
Um, it's about as far north as Churchill, but much more remote than Churchill. Churchill has a port, uh, it has a railway, even though the railway doesn't work all the time. It has a uh, electrical line that comes from the main grid in Manitoba. Um, and it has frequent air service. Um, Northlands has air service maybe four times a week. It has a winter road. If you um, were driving from Winnipeg, you could get to Northlands on a good day with about 30 hours of straight driving. Um, the winter road is terrible and getting worse with global warming. Uh, about a thousand people live there, which is actually more than live in Churchill. It is an astonishingly beautiful place. Um, I've been to, uh, I guess, about a dozen, maybe a little more First Nations in Manitoba. And it, it is striking to me how beautiful these places are. Um, this is a picture from December 4th, about five years ago, um, in the early afternoon. So we're pretty far north. The sun is now only going to be up for maybe eight to 10 hours a day. And kids are out on the lake playing maybe the most Canadian thing you could possibly play, shinny, ice hockey. And um, uh, it's beautiful in winter. It's beautiful in summer. It's a wonderful place to live. I get why people want to live there. There is a big problem. It's that all of the energy in the community, um, stationary energy, so heat, electricity, moving energy, airplanes, uh, boats, trucks, all of it is fossil fuel. So they're not on the main electrical grid in Manitoba. They're one of four communities like that. So they're entirely dependent on diesel being brought in to run the local electrical system that Manitoba Hydro operates and to heat all the houses and buildings. You, some of you may think of yourself as, as fairly adamant environmentalists who hate fossil fuels. Trust me, I've never met anybody who hates diesel more than the people in this community um, and in the other diesel communities. It is a horrible fuel to have to live with. Um, they have to bring in close to 2 million liters a year over that winter road. And this year, the winter road was only open for a few weeks. You have to get the fuel in, you have to store it. Um, then you put it in tanks beside the buildings. <clears throat> it stinks, it leaks into the ground. Um, this is a shot of a leak. There used to be tanks here. Um, it's right by the school. And this community has, uh, it's built on an esker, which is a sand, long strip of sand and gravel. So the diesel, when it leaks, goes into the sand and gravel and plumes out underneath buildings. Um, if it hits the water table, it puts the water in the lake at risk. And people are dependent on that water for drinking and for a big portion of their food because fish is a, a major staple there. So the, the effect of diesel is horrible. I got involved um, at the request of a group called Aki Energy. Um, maybe some of you have heard of it. It's a First Nation owned and operated social enterprise that has been involved in um, not only, but a, a lot in these four communities, um, working with the communities to put in geothermal systems. They've figured out a way to put in geothermal systems using local labor, um, largely local equipment, faster and more efficiently than you can do off reserve. So, <clears throat> through them, they've probably, there's probably been maybe 800 houses that have had their energy bills cut in a quarter. And the First Nations communities have noticed that. They've noticed that the costs are less than when they bring in um, outside people. People love the fact that they get training and jobs. They like the fact that it improves their own houses and their neighbors' houses. It's a great organization. It's done amazing work. 
other communities noticed and um, the people in Northlands, the chief and council, this is about seven years ago maybe, <coughs> said to Aki Energy, well, if you can do it down there, can you figure out how we can get off diesel up here? Because we get keep being told by everybody, you just have to learn to live with diesel. It's, it's the only possible energy source. And at the time I was doing a little bit of consulting for Aki on the, with three First Nations about biomass, because I've done some biomass stuff at, at Providence. And I was doing pre-feasibility studies on uh, what community buildings in three different communities could be heated with biomass. Um, for uh, biomass is a jargon term from the, uh, the energy world. Uh, if you're near trees, biomass just means trees. If you're near farmland, biomass can also mean uh, waste materials from uh, growing things. So uh, uh, straw, uh, oat hulls, all sorts of stuff like that. So not surprisingly, it turns out that all three communities have plenty of biomass and, and could easily be um, um, heated. Their buildings could easily be heated by biomass. So while I was doing that, um, uh, Aki said to me, so Northlands is curious about what could happen with energy in their community and renewable energy in their community. Why don't you come up and see if you can figure something out? So one of the things I wanted to say is that um, there are way more than just one or two or three First Nations that are doing work in renewable energy in Manitoba. Um, it's different kinds of renewable energy. Some have been more successful than others, um, but a remarkable number of First Nations are working very hard to make renewable energy real and to get off uh, fossil fuels. They've faced all sorts of obstacles. Um, Swan Lake is an interesting example. You know the St. Leon and uh, San Joseph wind turbine farms? There's about 100 wind turbines in each of those. They have a, those two entities, um, they have a long-term contract with Manitoba Hydro to sell electricity from those turbines. Swan Lake was a First Nation. It's very near St. Leon. It was a First Nation that wanted to do exactly the same thing. So they spent a couple hundred thousand dollars on a feasibility study. Got the right amount of wind. They've got land. They could do this too. And then something, after a number of years of effort, fell apart in the negotiations with Manitoba Hydro. So we still only have two wind uh, farms. And it would be great if Swan Lake would have one. Pretty well, any First Nation in southern Manitoba could have a wind farm. But lots of the others are doing really interesting work, um, some in conjunction with Manitoba Hydro, some on their own, um, worth exploring individually. And the other thing is that it's worth knowing about, um, there are First Nations all over Canada that are doing this work. This is nowhere near all of them. This is just a smattering. And there's all sorts of interesting things about this. One, one of them is um, most Canadians live within about 100 miles of the American border. Um, First Nations people live all over our country. And so the projects that are uh, focused on renewable energy that they're doing are all over the country. Just a few little examples. Sachs Harbor um, put up solar panels quite a few years ago. Very simple system, um, but being able to have electricity, especially in the summer, especially when you think about how much it costs to get diesel up there and run a diesel generator, being able to have even a small amount of solar makes a big difference to cost and to quality of life. Old Crow, they're far enough north that it makes sense to actually put their panels vertically on a building. Bedziata has quite a large solar array that they put up. And uh, Inuvik uh, put a solar array on one of their community buildings. Lutzel K is a really interesting Dene community. 
they put up a solar array. This is local people putting it up. Um, and you'll notice that the technology they're using for the uh, anchoring the solar panels to the ground is actually pretty simple. We um, uh, used or started with this idea in the work that we're doing in Northlands. We modified it, but we started from this as an example. Fond du Lac, um, another Dene community, um, solar panels all over the school roof. Deer Lake, same thing, solar panels all along the school roof. And then there's other interesting things. This is called Run of the River. It's a small turbine. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting about this is um, that Hupa Kasseth has done is they've generating enough power both for their whole community's needs and for the nearby non-First Nations community. So they're now selling power to their neighbors. This kind of technology, uh, this small turbine systems doesn't work everywhere. You need a very particular kind of river, um, but where it works, it works really well. Vic Maubert has a larger one, but it's smaller than the kind of typical um, uh, hydro system in Manitoba. And then um, there's a growing amount of biomass up uh, projects happening in uh, Yukon, the Northwest Territories, Ontario, Quebec, Manitoba, Saskatchewan. One of the most interesting is a place called Ujibugumu in uh, the interior of Quebec. The, uh, they actually built the entire town around the idea that they would have a single source of heat. So they, all of the buildings are heated from a single central system. And the pipes go out to all of the houses and all the community buildings. It's a, it's a, a very interesting planned community based on um, planning for renewable energy. So that's a really quick look. If you ever want to spend time discovering, focusing on learning about renewable energy off the beaten path, renewable energy that doesn't get a lot of coverage, um, I would suggest spend some time wandering around these First Nations and finding out about them. They're on the net. You can find out about them, but they're doing very interesting work. But let's focus on what Northlands uh, what I've been doing, what I've been privileged to be able to do with them and what they're doing. So uh, I guess nice community, great place to live. Um, when they came and asked uh, Aki, is there anything that, that you can do? Isn't there an alternative to diesel? Uh, Aki asked me to help develop um, a pre-feasibility study and then uh, the community and Aki and some other people locally from Manitoba, uh, including a guy named Kurt Hall, uh, worked on uh, a series of studies from 2015 to 2017 to try to figure out what is actually feasible. What could we do um, that is renewable energy based that will get this community off of the dependency on diesel? One of the realities of diesel in this community is um, that to get the diesel up there, you have to buy it down here. So 80 cents a liter, put it up, it's about 60 cents a liter to ship. Um, and then you have to clean it up after it spills, probably 20 or 30 cents a liter. None of that money stays in the community. So the federal government out of treaty obligation um, gives money for energy to the community and that money pours out immediately out of the community. So the community stays poor, gets no benefit and only gets the harm. Gets heat and electricity, but no other, no jobs, <clears throat> no economic development. And these are community, this is a community with very high unemployment. So we, we had a whole series of discussions over about a year and a half, um, including discussions with energy experts, um, and Aki asked me to be the project lead on this. Um, so I got to be in all of these discussions. One of my favorite parts of the discussion was the community meeting. Um, this is the community hall. On the right hand side there is uh, former chief Leo de Tanakazi, really interesting guy. Um, 
uh, I can remember he was teasing me about it last year. He said, when you first came here and talked to us about what we might do, um, I thought you were saying we should put a wood stove in the school. And I thought that was just the craziest thing I'd ever heard in my life. A wood stove in a big giant school? What are you thinking? Um, but he was patient and let me explain more what, what we were thinking about. And um, the community was really interested in this. They were interested because there were jobs as a possibility. They were interested because it meant that they wouldn't be so dependent on the outside world. And it meant they would have control over their own energy systems. Out of all of those discussions, we kind of came up with four or five basic design priorities for the project. Not everybody involved, so federal government put money in, um, Indigenous Service Canada actually paid for this project. Um, not, and the band put a lot of effort and work into it. Lots of um, uh, engineers and designers put work in. Not everybody had exactly the same priorities. So for instance, the First Nation um, was probably more interested in it, this producing work for community members than anything else. Federal government was probably more interested in reducing environmental harm almost than anything else. Uh, the designers that I was working with and myself, we wanted to make not just a one-off, but to develop something that could be expanded, could be replicated in other communities, could be integrated with other energy systems, and that could chart a course for a future without diesel. There are about 250 communities in Canada that are dependent on diesel for their heat and electricity. It's a lot and it's every single one of them has the same problem with unbelievably high costs, contamination, no jobs from energy, and a very high CO2 footprint. The other thing that <clears throat> was really important to the community is that the community should own the energy system. They find it very frustrating to have um, Manitoba Hydro own and operate the energy system that they depend on for electricity. So they said, if we're going to put any new systems in here, the community has to own and operate this. And the phrase that came out of that was energy sovereignty. Um, this is a little different than energy security. Um, energy security just means that when you flip the switch, the lights will always go on or your house will always be warm. Energy sovereignty has more to do with that plus agency and control over your own destiny. So the, the project that we did, we call it phase one. We couldn't think of a cute um, um, acronym. <clears throat> so we ended up just calling it the Environmental Remediation and Alternative Energy System, URAS. So um, it had two, um, pieces of remediation. So there were um, spills that were had soaked into the soil, into the ground we had to clean up. Um, there were three energy systems, a biomass heating system that use, uses um, wood left over from forest fires. That has a, a subcomponent where local people um, have to be trained and equipped to go out and harvest that wood. Uh, a geothermal system in the lake. This is probably the largest far north geothermal system. Um, it's too cold up there to put geothermal uh, loops horizontally in the ground, but you can do it in the lake. And then uh, a 282 kilowatt solar array. And we picked that size not out of random, we picked it because part of the uh, goal was to offset the electricity draw from the biomass building, um, from a new sewage station that was going in, and from the treatment plant for sewer, um, the area to treatment plant that, that was being put in. And then the other part, which is actually the hardest part, is to get all three of these energy systems to work together, to get the um, wastewater treatment system um, to work with the um, energy system, um, to uh, have an integration between those two. There's, there's two um, waste systems that are involved. One is the um, sewage plant. The other one is uh, a, a little furnace to 
um, burn used oil. So if you have leftover oil from uh, changing out your car, it's way better for the environment to burn it in a clean, properly certified um, uh, boiler than it is to, to put it on a plane or on a truck and send it back down. We also had to make sure that this system worked well with Manitoba Hydro's local grid and the diesel generators, which aren't very flexible. These are basically, you know, old fashioned um, or standard diesel uh, electricity generating systems. And then we also knew that, that there would be local operators, but there was also a remote support team, people with expertise in biomass, in um, systems communication, in uh, solar, in geothermal, that had to be able to work with the local people. It took a lot of people and a lot of organizations to make all of this happen. We started in 2015, maybe just at the very end of 2014. We began construction, I think, in 2017. And the first system went live in 2018. That was the geothermal system. And the biomass system came on that winter. And the um, solar array came on last fall. So all three systems are running now and the remediation, the decontamination is finished. But it takes a lot of people to make something like this happen. We concentrated mainly because this is the funding we could get um, on two clusters of buildings, uh, the school and a cluster of buildings down by the lake. And there were two reasons for that. One is that the school um, uses up almost 30% maybe 33% of all the heat in the community. And uh, both places were sites of diesel contamination, of soil contamination. So we were actually able to find, and we're really creative people inside the federal government who found money, not from an energy program, but from a contaminated sites program. So let's see. Let me show you these two images from overhead. So there's the school in the top circle and the uh, lakeside cluster buildings in the bottom circle. So this, will, this project um, will replace about a third of the heat in the community with renewable energy. About half of all the diesel that comes in the community goes into renewable into heat and half into electricity. So this project only gets us one sixth of the way to the goal of um, getting completely off diesel. Um, and in future lectures, I'm hoping to tell you about what's happening and in, in, uh, how to make that goal go even further. So this is the first big step. Um, it's a bigger step than let's say Winnipeg, Brandon, any other town in Manitoba has been able to take. If you think, um, how much people depend on fossil fuels for uh, heat. Uh, our house is gas heat. Think about what would have to change in Manitoba for 30% of that heat to be renewables. Uh, U of M is 100%, almost 100% dependent on gas for heat. Uh, think about what would have to change for them to be using 30% energy for heat. It's a big change. These are all the areas that we've ended up affecting. So the sewage lagoon, the um, uh, aeration of the lagoon now, the electricity um, that's consumed in that is offset by the electricity produced in the solar array. We have a biomass building and a biomass yard. The school is heated by the biomass. The um, lakeside cluster is primarily heated by lake-based geothermal which is in the lake here in this empty oval at the bottom. And there's a pipe, a couple of pipes that connect them. So back to this problem. The first thing you have to do, well, not first, one of the things you have to do is you have to clean up the soil. Typical process of cleaning up the soil is called dig and dump. You get a backhoe, you dig up, uh, in this case, this is the contamination by the school. It would have been probably 30 meters by 50 meters. 
and it would go down 10 to 15 meters. That's a lot of soil and rock to dig out. And you would take it out to the dump, put it in a containment area, and turn it over for about five years in the hope that it would all evaporate. And that's how it's usually dealt with. The designer that we had, uh, ASCII Geosciences, proposed a different way, which is uh, in situ um, decontamination. And the way this works is you inject um, surficants, which I think are like uh, an extremely strong detergent um, that will break down or connect the, the oil material to water. And also you can put in um, oxidization and uh, even bugs, microbes that will eat the oil. But you have to do it in a proper supervised, carefully managed way. So instead of bringing in a crew to do this, we brought in instructors. And so we took the Aki Energy model where you bring in instructors to learn a skill, to teach a skill, and then you apply it directly in, in the workplace. So these are local people injecting the material into the ground. And so they, they got work cleaning up their community. And they were pretty serious and dedicated about it. What happens once you inject the stuff, uh, it goes into the groundwater and then you have to pull it out with these little wells. And then you put it through a carbon uh, sieve and you end up with water that's clean, as clean as the lake. So you, you clean up the soil without having to dig everything up. Uh, one of the side advantages is that when you do dig and dump, you're gonna use tens of thousands of liters of diesel on the equipment. So you're using diesel to try to solve a diesel contamination. This uses only because it just has a few pumps in the, in the uh, little shipping container behind it. It uses maybe 500 liters of fuel. Way better um, for footprint, for carbon footprint. Second thing was in lake geothermal. This is a pretty common thing in um, uh, high-end cottages in Lake of the Woods. Um, so you may well have, if you ever get to visit someone who's fairly well off who has a cottage in Lake of the Woods and they have geothermal, this is what's in the lake probably um, just outside their cottage. It's the loops just like you would put in the ground, but then you um, attach, um, uh, uh, now what is this again? This is um, chain link fence. You attach it with uh, ties, zip ties, and you make a mat. And then the local people made six of these mats. So, and again, there's one or two people from outside who are doing the supervising and training. Um, and then everybody else is uh, local and they're doing the work. Um, some similarities to the uh, Habitat for Humanity model for how you build a house, um, but it's local people doing the work and invested in their own energy system. So you build these mats, and then once it's completely built, you haul lake, quite low tech. Um, the lake, at this point, this is probably July. It was pretty cold, too cold for me, but uh, they, were, they were pretty tough and willing to do it. So they went out, they haul it out until you keep hauling it out till you get to where it's 12 feet deep. You fill it full of liquid, it sinks, and then you spend a week or so dropping rocks on it to keep it anchored to the bottom. Once you've done that, um, Oh, this is just, before, this is uh, a nice, I think this was an early morning shot just before they uh, sank the pipes that are going out into the lake. Once you've done that um, and put the uh, uh, soil back or the, the uh, rock and gravel back where you uh, had the pipes going into the lake, there is no um, contamination or effect in the lake. Um, 
over time, um, stuff grows on that mat. Um, and with currents, mud will drift onto it and sand. And you end up with the, the um, uh, geothermal embedded in the lake, in the lake bed. Oh, by the way, this is unbelievably good water. It's clean. It's maybe some of the best tasting water in, in Manitoba. Okay, solar array. We found a place um, just behind the school that, um, as you can see, is a whole bunch of boulders. It's a boulder field. So this is not going to be a housing area. Uh, plus, because it slopes um, uh, a bit north, um, people don't want to build houses on here because you'd almost never see anything, uh, any sun, especially in winter. So this is not going to be a residential area. Um, so it's, it was not ideal for solar, but good enough for solar. One of the, we were, the hardest problem for us was to figure out how to anchor these things to the ground, the solar panels. You can put in screw piles. Uh, you can put in concrete um, castings and, and uh, slip forms, or you can figure out how to anchor them down. Remember the Lutzel K, they were anchoring, anchoring them down with boxes of soil. Uh, the engineers that we were working with figured out that we could do it with gabions, rock gabions. So we had to ship up these. Uh, it would have been better if we had just shipped up the metal, but there's no galvanizing system up there, no galvanizing tank. So these had to get shipped up. And we shipped up these. Um, those of you who are in architecture know that uh, rock gabions are a really trendy thing right now. We didn't do it because it was trendy. We did it because um, you can ship this, an awful lot of this up in a shipping container on a truck. Uh, in, and uh, then you can use local rocks to fill them because there's an almost infinite amount of rocks up there. So you lay out the, um, you prepare the ground. It doesn't have to be perfectly level. Um, you need a pair of these for each set of solar panels. So each of them, the two together, one side by side, have to be level with each other, but the whole strip doesn't have to be perfectly level. And you assemble the gabions on top and you fill them with rocks. They didn't do all of them by hand. It just happened that this was an afternoon, they'd run out of other things to do. Um, they didn't want to go home early, and there was a pile of rocks, so they filled them by hand with five gallon buckets, but quite a lot of it was done with um, a backhoe. So you just keep doing this till you have a long array of gabions that are holding down the um, uh, steel forms, and then you um, put the racks on top, you screw the racks on top. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is from October, 2019. All of the gabions are in, all of the racks are up. All of the solar modules are, were up there ready to be installed. And it was early October and it started to snow. The uh, people, those who were uh, supervising the installation and teaching people how to do this uh, wanted to go home and said, we'll come back in summer and finish it off. And the local guys kind of laughed and said, summer isn't till May. We don't want to wait that long. Um, so we would like to install it, even though there's a snowstorm. So they installed the solar panels all through October and into November in what we would consider blizzard conditions. They just considered it ordinary weather. And they ended up with a fairly big solar array. If you look on this picture, the school uh, is in the foreground. The medical center is over here, and the solar array is right here. Here's another shot of the solar array. And for size comparison, these are semi-trailers. So each one of these black rectangles is 14 solar panels. 
And that system, um, we finally cleared all of the hurdles with Manitoba Hydro. And we, it went live in September this year, and it works great. It's not the largest in Manitoba, but it's certainly one of the largest in Northern Canada. My hope is this becomes a normal thing in many First Nations um, in all over Northern Canada, because solar panels work great in the cold. And the amount of sunlight you have total in a year in Northlands is not that much different than Winnipeg. The main thing you have to do different is you have to figure out a different angle to maximize the, the um, how much uh, sun you get. Um, so when you're flying into the community now, this is actually a fairly big black object uh, on the, the area just behind the school. One of the biggest worries that leadership in the community had was that kids would throw rocks or uh, shoot at the solar panels. And that's one of the reasons why we designed it so that it was labor intensive to build those gabions. We wanted to make sure that the people um, whose kids were most likely to throw rocks were the people who had worked building it so that they would have a stake in that not being wrecked. If someone else builds it and um, just hands over the keys to you, you have no stake in, its, in, it, in it enduring. If you built it yourself, if you put sweat equity into it, you're going to make darn sure your kid and your nephew and your neighbor's kids don't wreck it. And we've actually had zero um, incidences of um, vandalism with it, even though it's only half a kilometer from the school. Now I want to tell you about the biomass stuff, because that's, um, if you look behind the solar array, you can see what looks like a semi-bald area. This was a fire area. This is people harvesting wood in that fire kill area. It's pretty much harvested now uh, in this picture. Um, but one of the nice things about this picture is there are nine jobs in this picture. There are nine people working. And in a community with 60 to 80% unemployment, nine jobs is a big deal. They harvest um, only burn areas. And it's not like uh, harvesting in BC or industrial harvesting down in, in Ontario, where you get huge machines in and you just chop down big swaths of trees. Um, you cut with a chainsaw and you only cut the dead trees. One of the big questions that everybody asked over and over and that is still getting asked is, are there enough dead trees? Um, and it's, uh, it turns out it's not good enough just for us to say, yes, there's lots of dead trees, don't worry about it. We actually had to do a whole series of calculations to figure out um, average burn uh, areas per year, regrowth, uh, volume per hectare. Um, so we did all of that. Uh, it turns out, yes, there are lots and lots of trees. Um, this map is northern Manitoba. The community we're talking about is in the top northwest corner. Um, the, th the four diesel dependent communities are here, uh, Barren Lands, C. Sedene, and Shimatawa over here. And these are the three that we've been working with on a series of projects that I'm hoping in a future lecture to talk to you guys about. So if we zoom in, this is burn areas within 100 kilometer perimeters of uh, radii of each of these three communities. They, uh, they're color coded based on how old they are. Um, the ideal time to cut dead trees after a fire for the uses that we're putting to is between three and about 15 years after the fire. You want to leave the trees long enough for the branches and the needles to fall off, for the bark to fall off, um, and for um, the cones to open and the seeds to fall down. And then you just harvest the central pole of the tree. And uh, 
not harvest once things have started really regrowing because if there's a lot of regrowth, then the caribou are gonna come back and start feeding there. So you have a window of about 10 years, maybe a little longer when you can harvest in an area. Let's zoom into Northlands here. These are fires within the 50 kilometer radius around Northlands. The uh, big purple blotch, which is between Northlands and Barrenlands, is about 150,000 hectares. It's a big fire. And the calculations say there's enough dead wood there um, if you were to harvest only that, uh, and you wouldn't harvest only that, and you wouldn't harvest it forever because it's going to regrow. Um, but there's scores of years of wood there. Here's what uh, further zoom in. So this is a 20 kilometer radius. And these are the areas that they've harvested. They've now, we're now finishing the third year of heating the school and those buildings down by the lake. So a third of the heat from the community, and it's used up this much burn area. So these tiny little red blotches, A, B, C, D, E, that's all the wood they've harvested to run the system for three years. And here's the plan for the next five years. So all the evidence, both the data that we have and studies that were done and the calculations we did, and, other people helped us with this, indicate that there will be enough fires um, to supply probably four to 10 times more wood, <clears throat> burn wood within an accessible area than the community will ever need for all of its heat and electricity needs. So it's, it turns out that dead trees are a renewable resource. One of the interesting parallels between what we're doing and the tradition of Dene people in this area is traditionally my understanding is you use live trees to build things and you use dead trees for heat. And so it turns out that we're actually following and honoring that tradition. Okay, what does the harvesting look like? The trees are not tall, 16, 17 feet, four to, to eight inches around in diameter. So you got to cut a lot of trees. This is uh, local people getting training on chainsaws. Um, everybody up there knows how to use a chainsaw. But one of the things that was really important is that we make sure every single person involved in this project knows how to take apart a chainsaw, diagnose what the problem is, fix it, repair it, put it back together again. Knows how to take care of it and knows how to use a chainsaw safely because there's no safety officers up there. The people actually doing the work have to internalize uh, the culture of safety. Otherwise there's gonna be accidents and you can bet if it, it turns out that this causes more accidents than diesel, uh, government is gonna be really unhappy to be continue funding it. Uh, this is uh, out in the bush, winter harvesting. Um, I was out here uh, for a while. I wouldn't last more than an hour out there. This is probably 30 below, 35 below. Um, in other words, a fairly warm day in January. So this is the camp. If you've ever been to a lumber camp in BC, this is a much lighter footprint than a typical logging camp. So one of the things that was really important um, to the community and to the design team was that the harvesting can't damage the ground. It can't um, destroy the ecosystem. And that was one of the reasons why uh, transportation in winter is so good because as long as you're not using really heavy equipment, the snow and ice will protect the, the, the ground when you haul with a truck, say or with a snowmobile. So we're still experimenting, trying to figure out the best way to haul. Um, snowmobiles 
that this size probably can't haul enough to be efficient. Trucks are more efficient, but you have to build an ice road across the lake or over the hill because a truck is not designed really for off-road. We've tried a snow cat. It worked okay as a hauling machine, but it need to be repaired so much that it had virtually, I don't know, 80, 80 90 percent downtime. So we still haven't found what I would call the ideal uh, winter transportation mode. You haul it into the community and you take it to the log yard, you take it off the, the trailer and you stack it up. And you have to stack a lot of wood. And then you put it, so this is about half the wood that's needed for a typical year. Then you put it through a chipper. Uh, here's a schematic of what happens once it goes through the chipper. Gets blown onto the walking floor, um, which is a, a raking system on a concrete floor. Goes into augers and hoppers, and the augers, um, uh, I'll show you some pictures in a sec. Take the wood and put it into the, the chips, into the boilers. The boilers heat a water glycol mixture, and that uh, goes in loops to the school and down by the lake. And it's all controlled by a computer system. This is the walking floor with the chips being blown on it. This is uh, about a day's worth of chipping. Just on a cold week is good for about three days worth of heat. These are the um, augers that are pulling the uh, chips up into the boilers. Um, a lot of this stuff, if you uh, went to a how to write colony, this would be completely ordinary. This would be, of course, we have this for our central heating system. The um, um, burner, the burn box, um, because it's controlled, computer controlled, um, you can change the parameters, but in the end, it's the computer that balances how much um, air, how fast the, uh, how much air goes in with a fan, how fast the, wa the walking floor puts the chips in, how fast the burn area here moves um, so that you get complete combustion. Uh, you can heat the entire school with less sort of smell and smoke than you would get from just having a wood stove at your house. The pipes leave the um, boiler, they go into a, um, a, a buffer tank, and then they go under, sorry, underground. So, uh, they go into pumps and then they go underground and are pumped into the school and it's integrated into its heating system and into the heating system down by the lake. This is uh, uh, Peter Tancazi, who is the local manager of the uh, energy systems. And he's, I think at this point, he's adjusting something on the biomass boilers. So it's a really interesting mixture of what you might call 19th century biomass systems and 21st century biomass systems. So he can see this from his home. He can see it on a computer. He can see it on the PLC on the wall. And the support team down here can also see. So if something is going wrong, it's very common. We have a probably phone call. He probably talks to somebody once a day down here about something. Um, you know, uh, he was wondering why something was beeping in the building. Turned out, um, we talked to the support people. It turned out that one of the batteries in the emergency lights needed replacing. So there is there is an ongoing support system. and I, That's a crucial part of making a system like this work. This is the school. It's about 20 years old. It's beautifully cared for. Uh, people are really proud of this, of this school. And you can see the size of it, why it uses up a third of the heat in the community. It was not designed 20 years ago to be particularly energy efficient. It's all right, but not particularly. Um, it doesn't face south, for instance, it faces, faces east. So it doesn't maximize um, uh, heat, uh, natural rate and natural heat. This is the lakeside cluster that has both um, geothermal as a primary heat source and biomass as a secondary backup heat source.
uh, I think it's Darwin, who is showing one of the government people how the system works, which I kind of really like because usually you think that that the outside experts have to explain stuff to local people. In this case, it's exactly the opposite. And then I also wanted to show you, I'm almost done. Ah, good, I'm almost on time, look at that. I wanted to show you um, uh, summer harvesting. So this is the crew uh, harvesting in summer. You, you might think, well, of course you wanna harvest in summer instead of winter. Although uh, you and I wouldn't last 10 minutes out here with the bugs. They are amazingly, um, amazingly energetic, those bugs. And then in the summer, if you're harvesting in summer, uh, you're just taking the main stem of the tree. Uh, technically, it's called the bowl. You stack it up like this. Um, people call this a teepee, but it's actually, technically, it's a stook. And that way, you don't have to um, uh, dig into the snow in winter when you're going to go uh, haul it in because it's way better to haul in winter. This is lunch at the um, harvest site. A few things that are really interesting about this. Um, the forest, the burnt forest, is what's in the background. It's not like a burnt forest down here. Only the bark and the branches go and the central pole is left essentially unharmed. The tree is dead, but the pole is unharmed. So it has an energy density and a moisture content as good as the very best wood pellets that you can buy. It's an extremely good fuel. Um, and the area in the foreground has already been harvested. So the fire went through about three or four years ago. These guys harvested this area about a week ago. And you'll notice that the process of harvesting had such a light footprint that nothing, the topsoil isn't topsoil, the, the, the organic material that is about six inches deep. It's mainly moss and ferns and small plants has not been destroyed, which is completely different than how you harvest um, in a standard commercial logging system. So the these trees have regrown, have started to regrow because the seeds opened up from the fire. And the process of harvesting is designed to, to be extremely, have an extremely light environmental footprint and to not harm that process. So you can still see the burnt moss um, underneath the new growth and the new trees that are growing up through that. I started with this picture and ended with this picture because this is the crew uh, going to work um, one August morning. I happened to be there. It is an, an unbelievable privilege to be able to spend time up there. Uh, that's great. It's a great part of my life to be able to do that. So this is their morning commute. They leave from uh, where, that, that, uh, where the geothermal lines went into the water. It, it's just where the boats are. Um, they paddle out 50 feet, put the boat, put the um, uh, engine in the water, the motor in the water, and 20 minutes later, they're at work harvesting. It's a great way to live and a great way to work. And right now, depending on the season, there's between 10 and 20 people in this community doing this work and providing heat for their community and for their families and for their school. And um, it's, it's uh, tremendously rewarding to be able to, to be part of this. My company was the project lead on this with all those other companies. And we're now providing management support to the local company that, that owns and operates the, the facility. I'm hoping to do more of these discussions and maybe one a semester or something like that. There's so much more to talk about. Um, how to do renewable energy to go from a, a sixth of the energy to 95% of the energy. How to do it in other communities how to do waste and recycling in these communities. How do we do food better? Um, shelter, if you've ever um, been on a First Nation reserve, especially in Northern Manitoba, housing is appalling. Um, transportation is difficult, expensive.
extremely intensive with, with uh, consuming consumption of fossil fuels. So specific areas that are worth talking about, but then also uh, how do you build a conceptual frame for what we're doing? And how do you frame goals? What are the, what are the goals of all the people? How do you make this stuff happen? And I'll leave it there. Holy cow, there's a whole bunch of people here. So I told you, I didn't see till now. I told you, you know, this presentation is <laughs> overdue. So we are, you know, we were really eager and hungry, you know, to see you and the projects. So Bruce, thank you very much. So this was a ah, my pleasure. Thoughtful. I don't know what's wrong with my voice. Something. I don't think it's COVID. I'll play it again. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with my voice. I don't think it's COVID. <laughs> So what a wonderful and thoughtful journey to energy, self-governance and independency, or you called it so sovereignty. That's a hard word for me to pronounce. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it doesn't really matter which word you use, okay. um, but I think the, the concept is, we know for sure from archeological evidence that the ancestors of these people have lived in this area for two and a half thousand years best evidence we have beyond that is that they've probably been there since the last ice age. So maybe 12,000 years. For all of that time until about 1950, they were completely self-sufficient with energy, totally self-sufficient. And in just 50 years, we've, we've managed to make them completely dependent on the outside world and they hate it. They hate it. And being able to play a small role in restoring that sovereignty, that independence, man, it's a great way to live. So Bruce, I think you still have a few minutes or yeah. hours, no, for and with us. So because we already received the first questions in the chat. So, you know, housekeeping for all those who want to ask questions. So feel free, you know, to activate your video, your camera, and also maybe you can show up on the screen if you are too shy to ask the questions. So type it in the chat and I can read them. So there are already two questions in the chat, Bruce. Maybe let's start with the two questions here. So Susie Melo, question. Do northern communities pay directly for their diesel fuel costs? Yeah, right now, this community is spending, um, let's see, it's about a million liters of diesel for heat and a million for electricity. So they're spending close to 2 million on each of those things. They pay Manitoba Hydro for the electricity and they buy the diesel directly from uh, wholesalers. So the three to $4 million leaves this community every year for energy costs. Okay, so there's a second right. question in the chat. Linda Lacombe, I hope I pronounce it right. What do you think the best option for replacing diesel in housing might be? So um, the, the uh, proposal we're working on, um, sort of phase two is, um, to have a district energy system with a central biomass boiler um, that goes to each house and provides the primary heat, ideally in floor heating in that house, but that each house would also have a properly installed and maintained wood stove. Because people, if you had just asked people up there, how would you like to heat your house? 80% of the time, the first answer is a wood stove. And those were all taken out for kind of unclear reasons and replaced with diesel furnaces. And so part of it is to restore that, that core preferred wood stove, but not a crappy one that's gonna produce carbon monoxide and not be properly maintained. You have to have the whole support system around that stove to make sure it's properly installed, properly serviced every year, um, that the CO2 monitors are working, all of that stuff is, is right. But then that would be, each person could say, well, I want to use my wood stove every day. 
and they would hardly ever uh, their their the district loop that's heating their wood their um, in floor heating would hardly ever turn on. But if someone has a preference, no, I don't want to use my stove only you know once a week, or I want to go away for two months or a month and leave my house. The in floor heating would keep the heat in the house, keep it going. I think that's probably the best. Geothermal will work for some houses near deeper parts of the lake, but um, at this point, probably biomass is the best choice. Thank you. There was Michael Cox. I see you here on the screen, mm -hmm. and you shared a photo with all of us. Do you want to comment on that, or yeah, I, just, I just wanted to offer this to Bruce. Uh, I was yeah. in the bush in northwest Ontario. He was trying to figure out how to, how to haul the logs from the cut site to the to uh, mm -hmm. the boiler. Uh, this might work. We we've, we've talked about this actually. The, this is a community that's a Dene community that has no tradition of caring for horses. And the, the weather up there is probably not, even if you were good at caring for a horse, you were at a big risk. Um, so it hasn't risen to the top of the list. <laughs> if it was a community, say, around Prince Albert, um, that had more of that tradition, I think that that might well be more feasible. On the other hand, it's another employment opportunity. Yeah, it is another employment opportunity. Yeah, it, it's definitely worth thinking about, but um, they looked at me pretty sideways when I suggested biomass heat. And it, they looked at me very sideways when I mentioned that horses sometimes draw bio, are used to draw this stuff. But they bought one, they might buy two. Yeah. <laughs> while, I, while I've got microphone here, uh, it's, uh, it's, was, this whole thing was really interesting for me. I lived for two years in a Iqaluit mm. uh, on Baffin Island uh, uh, when it was just not quite yet part of Nunavut. Nunavut didn't exist except in dreams. Uh, and the last project I work on before I came south was to not get rid of the existing diesel plant. At least the existing diesel plant to produce electricity uh, ran all that uh, condensate water down through the community and heated the school and the hospital and a number of other buildings. Uh, the project was to abandon all of that and put little diesel boilers in each one of those buildings and create diesel mm. boiler rooms in order to do that. So I'm yeah. pleased to see that one of the dots on your map that showed uh, some work on uh, on looking at uh, alternate energy sources uh, at Iqaluit. Uh, yeah. So. so this community is about 100, 100 kilometers south of the tree line. So they have enough trees to be able to do this. North of the tree line, different problem. I, I have yet to see a good study or any study actually about uh, in ocean geothermal. Um, yeah. If it works in a lake, you would think it would work in the ocean. Well, the real one of the challenges, obviously, in Calloway is uh, forty-foot tides. Yeah. Put it a long way, yeah, uh, away from the the house that needs to be heated. Yeah, and then the other question is, does vertical bore geothermal work up there? I'm not talking about getting down to the steam level, but yeah. you know, five hundred meters down, if you can get a, we we didn't um, we looked at it but didn't choose vertical bore because of the winter road problem. You'd have to bring up a, a, a big heavy drill and you'd have to leave it there for a year, which makes well, it really and Drilling through an asker is a lot different than drilling through either permafrost or, or granite. Yeah, yeah. It's enough of me. Thanks very That's much. Thanks, Thanks very much. It's great. Uh, it's two questions in the chat, but I see uh, Victor Bargan, are you? No, you're on the screen. Do you want to ask a question, Victor? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, of course, we speak only in German. I know, Victor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of reassuring. Um, I actually had a question, and I was hoping you might elaborate a little bit on what I think might have been a, a tougher process. And I know, I know you only had an hour to go through it, but you had a lot of work to do to get the community and council on board and I'm wondering I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the 
uh, the obstacles that you didn't foresee? Like, what were some of the obstacles yeah. that you, you just didn't see that, you know, it's that old phrase, I didn't see that one coming. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the small p politics? That's, uh, not, a, yeah. that's not an architectural question, but in order to get some of this stuff done, you've got to you've got to bring people on board. Mm -hmm. What what surprised you in that process? And let's just deal with Northlands if that's okay. Yeah, no, Northlands the community was not a big challenge. There were some challenges, but not huge, right? If you think about how challenges it's challenging it's been to try to get U of M to put biomass heat in with their central plant. That's been way harder than Northlands. Um, the, uh, and other parties, especially Manitoba Hydro was a bigger challenge than, than the community. The community's biggest issue of concern was the lake. Right. Um, they're dependent on that lake for water, for food, and for the sense of self and community. Um, and so touching the lake was extremely worrying. And it took a long time. Um, and the, it was the leadership in the community, actually, that reassured the most worried people that, that yes, they are going to put this in the lake, but they're going to do it in a way that will not damage the lake, and you'll never see it. Um, so we, we, part of the design process was, what is the lightest footprint we can use to get this into the water? So there isn't, there wasn't a big, heavy front end loader, six, you know, 30 feet into the water doing this work. It was everything that could be done by hand was done by hand. And turns out it's actually not more expensive to do it by hand, um, to do it, to do with a light footprint, but, um, oh. And, and it turns out you can employ a lot more people. On yeah, that, that too, that too, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I would, uh, what I found is, is the more you could, the better I got at listening. I'm not really good at listening, but the better I got at listening, the more you could hear what the values and goals were under the first things people said. And well, okay, what's what's the goal underneath that one? What's the deeper goal underneath that one? And if you can find out what those are and figure out if it's true, if your project actually meets those deeply held community goals, then it's not going to be subject to political whims because then when the, we're on our fourth chief and council, um, if you, what you're doing actually uh, embodies the core goals of the community, the deeply held goals of the community. Um, the politics is just the surface froth on top of that, because everybody, everybody truly does want to be able to control their own energy destiny. They truly want that. And they want, you know, to have 15 people wandering around the and, and, uh, harvesting equipment and safety training. Um, that's, that's a big thing that changes a community. It, they were extremely skeptical that this would ever happen. And one of the deliberate strategies we employed was to go as fast as we possibly could, even if things weren't always completely ready. If, you know, if the design wasn't at a hundred percent stage, we're still going to plow through to the next stage because there have been Every one of these northern communities have had 20 proposals come to them, and 19 of them fizzle out to nothing. And we just thought, okay, we can. So we in, we've gone from very first visit to everything is functioning in six years, which is considering how complicated this whole system is, is about half or a third of the typical length. And that was that was very deliberate. Speed is your thanks. momentum is your friend. Yep, thanks, Bruce. You, I, I, I'm noting a couple of questions. But, uh, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate yeah. it. It was very informative for me. Yeah, yeah Bruce. Thanks. No, it's my yeah. task. There's quite something to read. You know, there are quite a few more questions from Jeff Moros. 
what modifications were required to the pre-existing mechanical system at the existing school when the new energy source was added? Ah, okay. So, um, oh, and by the way, I think the, the schedule said that we're supposed to stop soon. I have nothing else I have to do this evening, so I'm going to hang around. <laughs> I may start drinking in a while, but other than that. Um, uh, the school already, one of the reasons that this was such a good project is the school already had a water glycol district or energy system, heating system inside the school that was run on four diesel boilers. So all we did actually is we tied into that. So the, the fluid is the same, the temperature goals are the same. We didn't have to ch change anything of the energy system in the school. Um, and, and the diesel system now is sitting there as a backup. Um, and we're hoping to get to the point where it's never turned on. And that extends the life of those diesel boilers. Um, and um, eventually people will say, well, we don't need to replace them. We haven't used them in five years. But we didn't, we deliberately with the school didn't say, we're going to take away the thing that you've been relying on and stick something else in. With the buildings down by the lake, we actually did do that. We took out the entire diesel system. We made geothermal the primary heat source and biomass the automatic backup source down there. Next question from Mercedes Garcia. Most solutions being implemented seem to be based on Western technologies. Oh, no, there was a, do you have any experience implementing or relying on indigenous knowledge and or strategies in this amazing pathway towards, towards energy sovereignty? Thank you very much for the presentation. Um. I would say, and I think the community sees this as a marriage of the best of their tradition and the Western tradition, or the the industrial, let's call it the industrial tradition, because right? um, burning stuff inside steel containers to make heat is the industrial tradition. Um, so the, the way the stuff is harvested, the way it's hauled, um, the way it's stored, what you harvest, so dead trees rather than live trees, um, all of that process um, is based exactly on the tradition which is still alive in these communities. So many people um, uh, cut down and bring in two, five, ten cords of wood every year for their home. So this is an expansion of that to a larger process. Um, but yes, the, the boilers, absolutely. That's a, that's a foreign technology, foreign to the tradition. Next question from Marcella Eaton. Do you think that the commitment of the federal government that was on the news today, which recognizes the rights to a healthy environment and on quick viewing, seems to suggest that protecting the health of Canadians is critical, uh, is critical, might help communities in implementing this type of project beyond the contaminated sites work. That does not emphasize so explicitly the rights to a healthy environment. I hope this makes sense. Yeah, yeah it does, actually. Um... I'm hoping we get to the time when um, getting off fossil fuels is not a political issue at all, that every political party is equally committed to it. We're not there yet. Um, in Manitoba, in the provincial level, um, the NDP talked a great game about getting off fossil fuels uh, and didn't actually do anything. Um, talked a very good game and haven't done much. Federally, um, it really has been the liberals who have put their money where their aspirations are. Um, I'm hopeful that that continues. I think the evidence is that it will continue, um, but it's hard to know. 
Um, politicians, generally, my experience is politicians will follow the public. Occasionally, you get a politician who believes something so strongly that even if the public doesn't support it, they'll still do it. Um, but for instance, um, the prime minister has said that he has a goal of getting all diesel dependent communities off of diesel within the next 10 years. That's 250 communities. That's a lot. That's a very, very ambitious goal. Um, but um, they set a goal to get communities off of boil water advisories, First Nations. They didn't achieve the goal, but they went a long way towards it. They put money where their goals were, where their aspirations were. So, yeah, I'm, I'm at this moment, I don't feel like we're pushing against a closed door. I feel like we're um, having to demonstrate that this isn't pie in the sky and that it can work long term in remote communities. Um, but not that people are skeptical about its value. Next question. Oh, no, it's popping up. Hank Venema. Hi, Hank. Hi, Bruce. Wonderful presentation. Was the combustion system of the shelf, now in brackets, made in Manitoba, question mark? So the, the combustion system, consists of two parts. There's the, the uh, boiler at the top that has all of the heat exchange systems in it. And then there's the steel firebox. The boiler at the top with the heat exchange is made in Quebec. And then it's shipped out to um, a really interesting company in Low Farm called Sim. And they assemble them into boilers. And they're one of, I think, probably three established companies in Manitoba that do that. We had choices of other boilers. There's lots of biomass based boilers made all over the planet. And I would call theirs a robust, tough system. Um, and it developed in the Hutterite world. Um, so it's not as fancy as, as, and as sophisticated or as finicky as um, some of the ones you can get from Austria and Germany. Um, but it's also not as, as, it's also way more solid as a technology than um, you, you might typically get from a Chinese biomass system. So there's so, a, a comment or link from Ted Landrum. Anyone serious should sign on to Architects Declared Canada. A comment from Marcella Eaton. Thank you. I hope it does continue. A comment from Victor Bargan. Great presentation. Thanks. Hank Venema. Thanks. So are there more questions? From Michael Cox again. Talk a bit about the boiler chimney systems. Uh oh. <laughs> now we're into technology. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I would turn to my uh, good friend um, uh, uh, who knows everything about boilers, but he's not in the meeting. <sighs> um, so uh, what would you like to know about the boiler systems? And maybe I can answer a question. If not, um, I will put you in contact with uh, our geothermal. Well, just just one, of the, one of the bad things we always talk about in terms of burning wood is uh, uh, smoke, carbon, all that stuff back yeah. in the air. So what are yeah. we, just in a general sense, what are we doing to mitigate yeah. against that to improve the carbon footprint of the whole system? Yeah, so the, the, um, the, there's two problems with burning biomass, right? One is, is the particulate matter if it's incompletely combusted. And the second one is the CO2. Um, the because of the computer control and mon ongoing monitoring and the design, it's, it's essentially, uh, well, it has to have the same level of combustion completeness as uh, any other furnace, like a gas furnace or a diesel furnace. So it, it has to meet those standards. Um, and it does. There, there is no smell or smoke that comes out of this thing. 
there's a little bit of moisture, but we're dealing with 5% moisture in, in this wood. So there's hardly any um, uh, steam either. The CO2, um, it's, I would call biomass a light green fuel, not a deep green fuel. Um, it's considered um, CO2 neutral because the tree took the CO2 out of the air within the last 50 years and you're just putting it back. Um, which is better than coal and fossil fuels because that's a 200 million year arc. Um, but I, I wish there was a technology that was as advanced as this that didn't produce any CO2, but there isn't that I know of. And we, we deliberately didn't pick um, experimental technologies. Doing this in a remote, communi remote community with local people seemed experimental enough so we, everything we picked, the solar array, the biomass, the geothermal, all of it was, okay, this, this has to have been done 200 other places or you know, many, many other places before we're gonna do it here. Well, and when any of it breaks down, it's gotta be fixed by the folks in the community, not wait for somebody to fly up yeah. and in the same system that put, weather system that put the system that out of commission in the first place. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and part of having a local manufacturer meant that, that we weren't dependent on someone flying in from Norway, say, which, you know, that, that would be bad, even if the Norway system is more sophisticated than this one. It's already been done. Yeah. Yeah, biomass um, boilers, combustors are pretty mature technology if they're properly managed. Yeah, and honestly, there's less smell from this than there is from a house wood stove. Yeah, I wasn't complaining. I was looking for arguments that I can use. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no problem. So Bruce, comment from Farina uh, Kalik. Great presentation. Thank you very, thank you. Very informative, great insight. From Lancelot Core, a question. How do you plan to spread the word to get this project known with other communities? It seems like that's the next critical step yeah. if you were going to sway public opinion. Thank you so much for the inspiring presentation. So we had a whole uh, marketing plan, which uh, would have kicked off with a minister coming up and cutting a ribbon. Um, and we were gonna launch it last March because we knew last March that everything was working and we weren't just cutting a ribbon in front of something that has problems. Unfortunately, COVID hit. And so no minister is allowed to go up there. I'm still hoping we can do this in fall. Um, these three energy systems together, plus the um, uh, uh, water treatment plant make this one of the leading environmentally green communities in Canada, not First Nation, period. Um, and so I think there will be, a. I know there's a lot of interest amongst First Nations and uh, we're working with uh, two of the other three diesel communities right now to try to um, replicate this there. Um, it's not a matter of trying to convince people that they should do this kind of stuff. It's a matter of trying to find the funding. And I think the, the marketing of it, which will come when we can do that ribbon cutting and make the case that um, uh, First Nations are leaders in this field rather than followers. I, I, I think that's how it will work. I think, I guess we'll see, won't we? Bruce, I have a question, no? Uh, yeah. Your presentation was very much about energy production. So what's about energy saving? So it's very clear the yeah. landscape plays a major role. But at the very beginning, you were asking or questioning why might this be of interest, you know, for faculty of faculty of architecture? What's about mm -hmm. housing, you know, improving housing quality, yeah. also with regards to saving energy? Yeah. So um, I think I would have two answers to that. Um, the first one, which is maybe just a little bit cheeky, is if you're addicted to heroin, 
the solution is not to uh, consume 30% less heroin. Right? We're addicted to fossil fuels. So the solution is not, okay, how can we consume 30% less fossil fuels? So energy, even the most efficient house up there, if it's still diesel dependent, is still going to be consuming an outrageous amount of diesel. Um, so that's the first answer. The second answer is, yeah, the demand side management is an absolutely crucial piece. Um, and actually, we're, we started um, in fall with my students and Barren Lands, which is a neighboring community, um, to develop a full energy retrofit plan for the whole community. And we just finished a meeting this week with the community and Efficiency Manitoba to implement that. So I, I think over the next um, over the next year, we'll get that started. And that includes uh, training for local people to be able to assess the houses and then do the work and then inspect that it's been properly done. Um, there are lots of challenges with energy efficiency in houses in Northern Manitoba. Um, the biggest challenge is moisture. If you make the house airtight, you're gonna have within six months, you're gonna have mold, and, and deep problems with moisture. So we have to balance how do we um, make the building more energy efficient with how airtight should it really be. Part of the difficulty is the heat recovery ventilation systems that are commonly used down here um, um, basically stop working at 30 below and they go into almost entirely defrost mode and they consume electricity. So um, in north of 55 in Canada, most of the HRV systems are actually turned off. So um, I'm working with a, or an engineering student is working on a um, no outside energy system for uh, um, extracting the moist and contaminated air from underneath the house. Um, and I think that mixed with really smart um, energy improvements in houses will cut it down 30 to 50 percent. Um, and that paired with moving to renewable fuels, I think, gets us to houses that are um, suitable for that climate and suitable for how people use them and aren't expensive to run. So yeah, so it's, it's two pieces, right? You need you need to use less, and you need to use the right stuff. So it's we're all addicted to heroin. Um, I have a gasoline-powered car and a natural gas-powered stove. You know, I, I have the addiction too. Um, and these communities, the 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 suffering from the addiction is much worse. So the stink of having diesel. If you have diesel. Uh, a spill from the tank outside your house, it'll seep into your um, crawl space and into your house and your whole house will stink of diesel for 10 years. Um, so the punishment of using fossil fuels up there is worse than down here. Mm. Yeah, but yeah, figuring out how to reduce, maybe not to net zero, but certainly, um, for instance, face the windows south. Make the northern wall a foot and a half thick. Um, you know, really basic architectural things um, haven't been done up there. A house up there that's a thousand square feet that is horrible to live in costs as much to build and deposit there as um, our house. And we live in a very nice house. You know, it's the housing is appalling up there. So sounds a bit. There's a need for architects. Yes. Um, although, um, so I've read the 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 book about this this community and another neighboring community and housing that architecture put out. Um, one of the things I want to do in the next presentation is to look at the architecture that people actually build up there already that's totally unnoticed and is totally unnoticed in that book. Um, and I think can be a basis for a much more successful architecture up there than, than the architecture that we would wanna um, 
that, that currently goes up there, which is these crappy two by six houses, um, or a fancy new West Coast piece of architecture, right? That'll cost a million bucks. Um, I, I, I'm, I've seen them and I'll show them in the next presentation. Um, buildings that people build on their own from found materials and um, stuff that's local and scrounged to make um, what we might down here call trendy tiny houses. They use for all sorts of purposes. Um, then there's also people who build cabins. A lot of people build a cabin around the lake and to take those two traditions and strengthen them and, and build on them, valorize them, um, I think is a, a, a really good way forward. Last summer, um, the, there was a presentation, I think it was part of uh, the RAIC Festival of Architecture slash uh, Educational Symposium. And one of the presenters was talking about some experimenting that was being done with mass timber buildings, uh, mm -hmm. and drilling holes through the timber in a scientifically organized fashion in order to allow the timber wall uh, to be the, the medium of heat exchange. Instead mm -hmm. of HRV, you actually use the wall. And I, tongue in cheek, but with a great deal of seriousness, having grown up in the bush, asked, so what's that different from a log building chinked with moss? <laughs> and if the <laughs> logs are big enough to give you the R value you need to contain the heat, and the moss and the cracks uh, is the medium of exchange that allows heat transfer between the cold air coming in around one part of the moss and going out the other way. Uh, and, you know, everybody kind of laughed and giggled at this crazy old white guy. What the hell does he know? But it's still I, I get that a lot. <laughs> but, that, but that's exactly what you're just talking to me about, Bruce, about yeah. building a shack, a hunting shack on the trail, right? It's just mm -hmm. you, you gather up what you can find, stack it up, uh, turn your back to the cold northwest wind, open yourself to whatever little bit of sun you get in the wintertime, uh, put a little pot belly stove in there and you're away. Yeah. Uh, so I think we need to begin to think about solutions that are more uh, based in the real world than in looking for the scientific. I mean, I'm, I'm not dismissing science, fair enough. But there are lessons that we learned generations ago that we've forgotten all about yeah. uh, as we've grown yeah. up and got, got uh, educated. And, and uh, I haven't had time yet, um, but I would love to see if we can build um, a vertical timber log building. The, yep. the logs up there are too short and too thin to do a traditional horizontal timber, but the Palisade style or the Quebec style would certainly fit. Um, and I'm curious to see if a double walled, so you have two sets of logs with, I don't know, um, uh, what is that stuff? Uh, rock wool in yep. between them. That would be one heck of a well insulated wall. And but you may have guessed that I'm from a generation, uh, I'm one of those leftover hippies. And, uh, you know, we decided that that wood pile uh, over there in the shed might actually make a pretty good wall. And it was called stack wall construction. And so a double stack wall yeah. with, uh, uh, with rock wool in the gap starts mm -hmm. to make some sense to me. And the, the great thing about rock wool, sort of get all nerdy here, is um, that it doesn't rot. And the mice don't like to live in it. Nope. And, and so the, the, it deals with the problem of moisture way better than, than pink. Okay, let me share a picture with you if I could. Um, Uh, where is it? So this is a building um, right beside a house. But 10 by 10 probably built from local wood and scrounge materials. Um, in this community in Lac Brochet, uh, the average house size is 900 square feet and about six people live in it in average. 
So the teenage son in, in this house really did not want to live inside the house. So his dad built him this and he lives out there. He has more private space. It doesn't have power um, and has a wood stove, um, doesn't have a toilet, but he would much rather live there than in, um, in the house. So there is, a, there is an ongoing tradition of building log structures up there. Um, and if you think about this is what the, a typical house is like that's been there 10 years, um, a log cabin is way more appealing than this. This house would have cost $200,000 to get up there and get installed. Um, uh, the community next door, uh, while they're 100 kilometers away, um, see Sidene. Um, it's really interesting how well documented their history is. This is um, a cabin from the 1940s. Um, this community used to live by Nezhanolini Lake and they were deported to Churchill. But this is a, a variable R value home. Uh, you pile the snow up in fall and it keeps the place warm all winter. Um, and then in spring, when it, when it melts, um, the, um, the thing airs out because you're actually going to spend, the, traditionally in the 1940s, you would have spent the summer somewhere else in a um, tent. And when you come back in fall, it's ready to be used again. So as far as I know, we don't have variable R value housing, but they did. And it turned out to be extremely appropriate. So Bruce, yeah, I see, you know, there's so much more to so share. Much more. And I think we will sketch, schedule you in very soon, you know, for next presentation. So yep. there's one comment actually from Jay. Now he's chairing our cultural events committee this year. And I think that's a nice, I would say closing comment for tonight. Thank you, Bruce, for your efforts on this front. It is also wonderful to wrapping up this year's talks with such a real and regional issue project. Thanks. And again, Thanks. Should, we, should, we, should we agree on, a, on the next presentation right now or should we meet a little bit later? Uh, I'm hoping to spend as much of this summer up north as I possibly can. So if it could be September, I could, live, I could say yes for sure. Sooner than that, I could say yes, probably. Okay, then I think we can look forward for another presentation full with wonderful imagery from far up north. So it was okay. fantastic. So thank you very much, Bruce. And we have to do this very soon again. So now after your summer. Okay, thank you for letting me into this world, the architecture world.